Hi, in this video we are going to implement this has augmenting pass method. So I'm just going to hover my mouth and create method, which is going to be a private method. It's going to return a boolean and it's going to have a parameter, the flow network, the source vertex and the think vertex. Okay. So basically on every single iteration, we have to reinitialize basically the residual network. So that's why I'm going to instantiate this edge to one dimensional array of edges. And of course we are going to have as many edges as the flow network dot get number of vertices. And we have to track this mark boolean array as well which is going to be a one-dimensional boolean array and again it's going to store as many booleans as the number of, of vertices. Okay. Then we are going to create a queue as usual for the Bradford search implementation and we are going to store vertices so it's going to be the queue and I'm going to instantiate it as a link list. I'm not sure whether you remember the Bradford search implementation, but basically it's just going to be a standard Bradford search. Okay, so this is the queue. I'm just going to add the start vertex, which is the source. And of course we have to set this source as marked. So the marked with the s.getID we have to set it to true. By the way, it's not a very, very fancy implementation. I mean, not a very object-oriented implementation to store this marked as a reference. And basically, we have, I think we have a Boolean. Yeah, there's the Boolean flag in the vertex, whether we have visited that given node or not. But basically, I implement this flow network and fourth Fulker zone to be able to check the minimum cut as well. Maybe I'm going to refactor the code later. What's very, very important to get a good grasp of the implementation of the fourth full care zone? That we have to look for the augmenting pass. What is it? It is the Edmonds cart implementation. So we have to make a Bradford search. Then we have to find the mean value, basically the bottleneck in the residual graph. And we have to add the flows in the original flow network. Okay. So while the queue is not empty and it's very important that we have to check as well that the marked on the t dot get id is not equal to true so what does it mean that the queue is not empty and haven't visited the thing so the node t so far okay basically we just have to make a simple breadth first search so we have the vertex v which is equal to the q dot remove we just have to consider every single edge. So edge E, flow network. Oh, okay, we have to, no, I have the flow network, okay. Flow network dot get adjacencies for the vertex V. Then we get the other vertex. So the vertex W is equal to the E dot get other vertex, not the V, okay, not the V but the w and if this e dot get residual capacity with the vertex v is greater than zero then we just have to check that if it is not marked so if the w dot get id is not marked so it is equal to false then we have to set the edge to with the w dot get id to be equal to the e we have to set it to be visited so marked v dot get id is equal to true and then we have to add it to the queue okay so basically this is a standard breadth first search and we just have to return with true or false and we are able to decide it with the sync.getID. Basically it's going to return after the breadth first search that okay, have we visited the sync? Because if we have visited it, it means that there's an augmenting pass from the source vertex to the target vertex, which is basically the sync. 
So if, if the thing is visited, then there's a path. If it's going to return false, it means that there's no more augmenting path in the residual graph. As I said earlier, it is a bit misleading because you may get that, okay, what does it have to do with the capacity? It's not about the capacity, it's going to return a flow basically. But usually in scientific articles, refer to this method as residual capacity. Okay, but what's important that we have to make a standard breadth first search. So that's all about this implementation. I think that we are going to need two more methods. First of all, the public double get max flow return this dot value max flow. And basically we have to check that whether a given vertex with a given index is in the minimum cut or not. So I'm going to construct the boolean method is in cut. It's going to get an index and it's going to return the marked at the index. So it's going to return a boolean. So this is why we have to store a reference to a one-dimensional boolean array this marked. And this is why I update it like this. Not a very, very elegant solution, not that object-oriented, but anyways, it's going to work just fine. And basically, this is what we are after. We would like to get a good grasp on the Fort Fulkerson algorithm. And I think that this implementation is going to show you how it works in practice. Thanks for watching. Hi. So in this video, we are going to test finally or maximum flow Edmonds Carp algorithm. I have constructed the same graph as we have discussed in the theoretical section. So we just have to instantiate the new flow layout. And sorry for that, I think that the number of vertices is just going to be four. Okay. Then we have the vertex 0, 1, 2, 3, basically the source vertex, then A, B, and the thing. We usually use the character S for the source and the character T for the thing. So basically, this is the flow network we are considering. Source, vertex A, vertex B, and the T thing. And we would like to get the maximum flow, which is equal to 8. So we have come to the conclusion that the maximum flow is equal to 8. Basically, the flow concerning the outgoing edges from the source vertex. Okay, the source vertex has just outgoing edges, so it is nonsense. But anyways, we have 4 plus 4, which is 8. And what's the minimum cut? We have come to the conclusion that the minimum cut is basically these two disjoint sets from S, A, B, and the lonely T in the other set. This is the minimum cut. So, okay, we would like to solve this problem programmatically. We just add the edges between the source and the A, then the source and the B. We have capacities 4 and 5. Then we have the A and uh, T with capacity 7. And then we have another edge between the B and the A and B and the uh, thing. So basically the vertex T with capacity 4 and 1. And we just want to solve this maximum flow problem and want to get the minimum cut. Okay, I'm just going to get rid of this. It's going to out basically the minimum cut, that what vertices are going to belong to the same set. So we just have to iterate through the vertex list. And if the, if the given vertex is in the cut, basically these are not vertices, but vertex IDs. Then we are going to print it. I'm just going to use something like this and some spacing. Okay, so let's run this algorithm. And as you can see, basically, the maximum flow is 8. Okay, this is what we have been discussing. And what about the minimum cut? We have the S, the vertex A, and the vertex B in the minimum cut. And basically, this is what we have been discussing in the theoretical section. So basically, it's working fine, or maximum flow implementation. Thanks for watching. Hi. In this video, we are going to talk about one of the most important applications of maximum flow, which is the so-called bipartite matching. Okay, so what is this problem? 
Basically, we have been discussing that there's a lot of lots of applications of maximum flow. And in graph theory, a bipartite graph is a graph whose vertices can be divided into two disjoint sets, u and v, such that every edge connects the vertex in u to one in v. What does it mean that, for example, this one, we have the set u, we have the set v, and as you can see, there are several vertices in both sets. But what's very important that the edges is starting in one set and ending in the other set. So there's no edge within vertices in the same set. Starts here and the end is here, starts here and is here and so on. So this is a bipartite graph. And the bipartite matching is, for example, let's suppose that we have a set of people P and a set of jobs J. Basically, we have two sets. Each person can do only some of the jobs, and we can model it as a bipartite graph. A matching gives an assignment of people to tasks, and a maximum matching contains as many edges as possible. So basically, the aim is to find an assignment of jobs to applicants in such that as many applicants get jobs as possible. So let's suppose the fact that we have two distinct sets, set U and set V. The set U contains the applicants basically, Adam, Sally, Joe and Kevin, and set V contains the jobs. Job at Google, for example, software engineering related job, Morgan Stanley, for example, quantitative financial analyst related job, Axon Mobile for accountants or whatsoever. And basically every applicant has some preferences that, okay, Kevin, for example, would like to work at Axon Mobile or at Google. He doesn't want to work for Morgan Stanley, so that's why there's no edge between Morgan Stanley and Kevin. Joe definitely wants to get a job at Morgan Stanley, as you can see. So there's just a single edge between Joe and Morgan Stanley, and so on. So basically, this is, for example, a maximum matching, where the maximum number of applicants get a job. And we are able to model it as a flow network, basically. We just have to create a source, and we just have to create a sink. What's very important that we have to connect all the vertices in the first set with the source, and all the vertices in the other set with the sink. It's very important that we have to assign capacity equal to 1 to each and every single edge. At the beginning, the flows are initialized to be zero, and basically we have to run our maximum flow algorithm on this given flow network. Okay, so we just have to find a maximum flow in the constructed network, and the maximum flow is going to be equal to the maximum matching. So in this case, for example, it's going to yield three. So the maximum flow is equal to 3, it means that the maximum matching is equal to 3, which means that exactly 3 applicants can get a job, one of them for Google, one of them for Morgan Stanley, and one of them for ExxonMobil. Okay, that's all about maximum matching, thanks for watching. Hi, in this video we are going to talk about the implementation of the bipartite matching, and it is approximately the same as for the Edmunds Corp maximum flow algorithm, except the fact that here we have the applicants, but here I assign characters to each of them, so A, B, C, D, and E. We have the jobs or the companies, I assigned number to them, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and we want to assign as many characters to as many numbers as possible. This is the maximum matching problem. So in the previous video we have discussed that the solution is that we have to create two extra nodes, the source, the S, and the sink, the T. And we have to add edges from the source to each of the applicants with capacity 1. And we have to add edges from the T, T to each of the jobs with capacity 1. So all of the capacities are 1. And in this constructed network, we have to run our Edmunds Carp maximum flow algorithm 
and the maximum flow is going to give us that what's the maximum matching i mean the it's going to be an integer so for example it is four it means that we can assign four applicants to four jobs if it's three it means that we have three applicants to three jobs if it's five the perfect matching it means that all of the applicants can have a job so that's what we do here we have the capacity one here one 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 and so on and we just add the edges accordingly you can play with it whatever you like and the maximum number of pairs we just have to run it the maximum number of pairs it is the maximum flow in our network it is five which means that all of the applicants a b c d and e can have a job so we can assign each character to each of the numbers without any problem so it's a perfect match so that's how bipartite matching works thanks for watching